Uh, welcome back. I'm being joined yet again uh, by uh, the wonderful uh, Errol Musk. And we're looking at um, all sorts of things, the newspaper reports and seeing what's going on over there. Um, and I want to have a look at a, a, a big, a, a deeper dive, if you like, to some of these uh, stories. And we talked about um, Elon Musk supporting Trump. Uh, but his employees at his company's predominantly back, uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, and according to Open Secrets, Tesla's employees have donated $42,824 uh, to Harris and only 24840 to Trump. Uh, at SpaceX, Harris received $34,526,000, while Trump got 7652 And ex-employees gave 13213 to Harris and less than 500 quid uh, to Trump. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, you know, again, a lot of the people that are employed in these places are they they live a life of plenty that that we don't in the, in the outside world really uh, most people don't even have any idea of that. That from their point of view, they they want to do good. They want to be seen as being good and and not. Uh, laying down any kind of laws or making things difficult for anybody else. And I presume they think that uh, the Democrats with uh, Kamala Harris uh, would be like that. Uh, they would uh, make things nice and easy for everybody. And whereas if they have Trump in, he's going to demand people must actually um, pay for their supper or something to that effect. And... Um, you know, I think that's probably the reason. It's a, it's a do-gooder community. You see, they, they 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 don't understand a lot of the time. Uh, they don't understand. A lot of them don't even know where thanks where um, where London is. They would say, for example, you'd be in America and you'd say, um, I, I I I've been to London, and then you and and you might they might say, well, London that's near England, isn't it? Right. Near you know, England, yes. Yes, I mean they they, they don't have a, much of an idea of things. It's it's actually quite odd. It's right. it's it's really really puzzling, and. Um, well, I, I think a lot, know, a lot of Americans actually don't travel, do they? They probably some, let alone traveling abroad, they probably don't travel out of their particular state, do they? Well, my experience of traveling to the states for the last fifty years is that um, certainly starting in the beginning, in my first trip to the United States was in nineteen seventy two. Uh, and when Jack Dempsey's was open and the mafia wars were going on, I mean, um, no one, there were hardly any people traveled to the United States in those days. In other words, almost no one from my country traveled to the United States. And when I went to England first on that particular trip, the people in England that I met, some relatives, were puzzled that I would go to the United States because they couldn't imagine going to the United States. Nobody had the sort of money to go to the United States. And um, when you got to the United States in those days, you realize that these people, if you said to them, I'm from, you know, if they asked you, where are you from? They really meant, are you from, assuming you were in some part of St. Louis, they would presume, are you from North St. Louis or South St. Louis? So when they ask you, where are you from? <laughs> you're supposed to say, I'm from, I'm from North St. Louis or I'm from Hazelwood, as it happened, which right. is a town north of St. Louis. And, and if you said, I'm from South Africa, there was like a big puzzle over their head. I mean, Africa? How come you, you're not from Africa? You're not black. People from Africa are black. Then you would say, no, I'm in a part of Africa where white people are. But it was basically, I use the example here, I've used the example here with people asking them when they query the people here in South Africa, query the intelligence of Americans and their knowledge of geography. I've said to locals here, did you notice what happened this morning in South Caledonia? And they said, what? What happened in, what do you mean South Caledonia? I said, it's the province of France. It's in the South Pacific. <laughs> what? I've never heard of South Caledonia. So you see, now I explained to them, just like you've never heard of South Caledonia, those people, which is a very real place, those people in America have never heard of South Africa or had never heard of South Africa. And so when you first started going there, you, I found myself, you know, it's pretty soon, uh, avoiding that I come from Africa, or if I was pressed, I would say I'm British. So in fact, on, on the first, second, I think the second trip I went there, I was because I was a city council of Victoria and I knew people in in uh, in uh, 
as it happened in Vancouver and Seattle. I knew people um, in, in the media from Thompson Publications in Ireland. They put me on television and radio there when I was a very young boy. I must have been about 25 years of age. Um, on radio and television in that area where they told me we were, we, they, they reached about 2 million people. And, and you know, it, and people inquired for me about South Africa and why on, they, asked, they could question, they could phone in and ask questions on the television. Why am I white and why am I from South, from Africa saying I'm from Africa and so on? And then you realize that these people live in a, in a, in a sort of world of their own so that the, the East serves the West and the West serves the East and the North South serves the South and so on. And they, you might find now like Elon and Kimball both married girls who were from uh, North America, the first marriage. And uh, neither of them, had, one had never been out of California and the other one had never been out of uh, Ontario, uh, ever. And within a few months of marrying Elon Kimball, well, they got, Elon got married in, in St. Martin in the, in the, in the, um, in the Caribbean. And, and so within months, they, they had seen the whole world, you know, with, right. with my sons. It's kind of weird because they, you know, within months, they just did a quick whirlwind tour of the whole world. And, um, but generally speaking, that's the situation that you've got there. These people are not well, they're not bad, and they're well-meaning, but they don't understand what they are dealing with. They simply don't understand it. Their idea is, if people are hungry, why don't you just give them food? If people need homes, why don't you just give them home? If people need money, why don't you just give them money? That's the American approach. Yeah. And, 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 and why, why, why do you think that is, though, Errol? Is it just is it part of education? Is it is it just people just want to be deaf and blind to it? They want to shut out the uh, the outside world because it's all just too horrible. Uh, why, why is it that people don't yes, have that? Knowledge? I think I think if you look at American history in the thirties and forties before the Second World War, America looked as though in many respects it was quite a harsh place. But after the war and with the um, baby boomers and all that sort of thing. Life improved dramatically. You know, I, I mean, there was the Nixon showing um, Khrushchev what an American kitchen looks like right. in the 60s. I mean, we don't even have kitchens like that now in South Africa in most places. And they had it in the 60s in America. You know, certainly didn't have them in England in the 60s. So, you know, th these people live in a land of plenty. And if I might say without my daughter phoning me and saying, what am I saying? She, my daughter, that I had the child, Alexandra, I think of her particularly, not only her, but she she is a vice president of a company that she earns so much money that she she spent June, July in, 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 in Portugal and then in Jamaica, and she just spent two weeks somewhere, I don't know, I can't remember where, oh, Scotland. She spent two weeks in Scotland. She's 30, 30 years of age. So they live a life that is just very difficult for people here to comprehend. The ordinary working person in South Africa, the average income, the average salary is about a hundred pounds a month. That's what people earn here in South Africa. The average income is about a hundred pounds a month. And these people are living, my daughter there and her husband earn about, I don't know, um, I don't know, 10,000 pounds a month or something like that. And this is typical. I have another daughter there's 24. I mean, she has roughly the same sort of situation. These people are, it's a very, very well-organized, extremely uh, smart country. And it takes care of everybody. Right. There's no reason to not work there. There's every second shop is asking for um, work, apply, apply within, apply within. Every second one, and that I was there recently, and so there's absolutely no reason to 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 to, to feel what the way the other people do in the rest of the world who have no comprehension of things like that. And what I do notice to the Americans that I've seen there, that 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 they're they're actually in bit, bitter. Some of them are but young younger men are a bit of bitter there because they feel they should be doing much better than they are now. Mm -hmm. They only have perhaps two new cars. And they live in a, you know, uh, in a in a in a beautiful four bedroom home with two bathrooms and in a lovely suburb. But 
how come Elon has done so well and they're only sitting with two cars in a house in the suburbs? You know, uh, so there's sort of, that's not right attitude with it. If you and, 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 and you're right, because people rather than, and I always think it's probably the biggest difference between Britain and America. In, in, in America, they seem to celebrate a success, but in Britain, we seem to resent it. Uh, is that a fair summary? Well, I, I think in England, they, they, people have a, the English like to show that they, I don't know, stiff up a lip or something, or they can do without or something. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that probably just plain, you know, envy, you know, I would say. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate that you can't have that so much in England. Right. And um, on the other hand, England is uh, has become very socialist and, I suppose you could say so. There are a lot of social welfare systems at work in America, uh, in England, that aren't at work in, in 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 America. In other words, you can have what you want in America, but you have to get a job, and you have to go out and perform. And performing means if you like your job, this is quite important. Um, my daughter is at work. The one that I'm telling telling you about, she's at work at half past seven, right? Uh, and she's got two small children now. And she's she's a she comes she has a nanny, and she's home at nine, and sometimes she's not home at nine, and sometimes we join her for supper, uh, in the evening because she's still working, right. and so they their approach to the jobs they do is, um, you give everything every single thing, you know I mean um, that is t contrary to the social welfare system where you know um, the old joke where the Minister comes and says, the Labour Minister comes and says to the factory, um, I'm going to make sure you all only work every second Friday from now on. And a bloke at the bloke back shouts up, every second Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the Americans, they, 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 their work is a sort of religion. Right. You know. So uh, my, I think of my my uh, the, my daughter's husband that I'm talking about. You, you know, he takes his work terribly seriously, and so when he starts telling you about something he's doing, and of course it's all big stuff. You know, you listen religiously because it's so important to him, if, if you know what I mean. And that is a difference that I do see in America. They take their work, their jobs. They, they work very, very seriously. Yeah, and and, and yeah. another bit, another big difference, and it's something that uh, Elon's fallen foul of a few times is the sense of humour. And we've had a, a couple of examples. Some of the tweets that he puts out, a brilliant sense of humour. Uh, I think you told me a lot of it comes from Monty Python, uh, where growing up and working on that sort of basis. But you had the one about Taylor Swift, where uh, which in a reference to JD Vance when she was signing off on uh, the endorsement she was given to Kamala uh, Harris, she turned around and said she's uh, a childless cat woman uh, and elon volunteered he said well I'll, I'll i'll give you a child i'll look after your cat uh and i spoke to you about it last yeah. time i spoke to you about it last time you said i'd quite like to have a grandchild with uh with taylor swift well you know elon is a very red-blooded guy like us all and um she's a beautiful girl and um he has uh, in the years that have passed he's had lovely girls he he, he um he's he he, he he's he, he likes to be associated and likes to have lovely women. And so do any man I know for that matter, most men anyway, and, um, and a beautiful partner, let's say. And, um, and she would be a, a lovely uh, catch for, for any man. I certainly think she's probably one of the best looking women uh, around. And, um, and she's ter very talented. And I've even watched her on, uh, on, on, on shows like you have in England with, um, um, what's it guy's name? Uh, oh, I forget. Uh, Graham, was it? What's his name? Oh, uh, Graham Norton. Oh, yes, yes. Good yeah, Graham Norton. Yeah. Graham Norton. Yeah. And I've watched him, her on there, and and she's so natural, and yes. so you know, you just reach out. You want to reach out to her. So, uh, like any man, he, he any guy, he's putting his penny in. You know, I mean, don't forget me. I I might, you know, I mean, you know. I, well, I, I, I think, think we, I think the point the point is this though, Errol, because a I lot think of people. More to just yeah. his, there's more yeah. to his. Uh, I'll give you a baby, and I'll look after yes. your cat. Then, 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 then you think. Yeah. Oh no, no. I, I think well, there's two things, isn't there? One is the the sense of humour, because a, lo a lot of people then reacted so badly to that tweet, saying well, it's oh, totally inappropriate and things like that. Oh, what's, what's your take on that? Oh, that's ridiculous. 
there's no law, there's no rules in love and war. There's no what, what are the rules in love and war? I'd like to know what they are. There are no. Yeah. Well, I guess it's so, understanding, isn't it? And if people understand where people are coming from, and we've unpacked this beforehand, is that uh, intention and reality are not always aligned. And if you've got a sense of humour, in this day and age, people just take everything at face value. And people are so quick to take offence, as opposed to turning around and saying, look, just enjoy it. Just It's a joke. It's, that's, that's the whole principle. And we've, we're losing that sense of humour now, aren't we? Well, you know, um, take offence. You know, I mean... I, I I think that's just so silly. Uh, on the other hand, they're just looking for attention or something. I I don't know. I mean, one can take offence at certain things, obviously, you know. But uh, but the type of things we're talking about, these are not things to take offence over. And um, I mean, you know, uh, I I saw with uh, Starmer. He uh, I think it's Starmer. He doesn't. Oh no, uh, it was Gavin Newsom. He doesn't like the, the humour. And so he thinks he can legislate against the humor. Well, you can't do that. I mean, yeah. that's that's impossible. And to legislate and British humor, I mean, that's humor. That's the beginning of all humor. I mean, you can't legislate against that. I mean, it's ridiculous. And taking offense, I mean, that's nonsensical, you know. But uh, I think those who pretend to take offense, it's just a new a new platform for people to pretend that they take offense, you know. So no, you're, no. you're absolutely right. Well, the other, the other tweet, the recent one, was about uh, in in response to the appalling assassination attempt, second one now on on Donald Trump. Uh, uh, Elon posted out about, well, look, nobody's taking a shot at, at Biden and Harris. Uh, I mean, he's deleted that that post now, uh, but that was obviously meant as a joke as well, wasn't it? Well, yes, of course. I mean, uh, what I think he meant there was that they're not worth. Nobody's seen them as being worth the trouble, uh, you know, to 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 worry about. Uh, doing something like that. Of course, it's stupid to think of doing things like that, but it's what happens. And, um, you know, it's happened for th thousands of years. But uh, I think with Julius Caesar, it happened as well, didn't it? No, it's and, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not new. Et tu, and, Brute. Um, absolutely. It's, uh, no, it's not new. <laughs> so, uh, you yeah, know, so, I mean, it's, it's a, I think all he's saying there is they're not particularly worth, worth the trouble. Yeah. Well, what would be the point, you know? You're not achieving anything. Well, but, I mean, um, the, the, big, the biggest problem we've got as well now, it's all about sort of freedom of speech and com comedians are now sort of being, uh, having their wings clipped, if you like, is they, the whole idea, I was calling the comedian who turned around and said, look, the secret of comedy is knowing where the line is and going beyond it. Because it's always been about that sort of side. But nowadays, I mean, freedom of speech is probably in the most critical uh, position it's been in for a very, very long time. Never has, has freedom of speech been more important. We need to hold governments to account. We need to hold politicians. We need to hold the, the, the media to account. And at the same time, they're clipping the wings, aren't they? You've got the situation in Brazil where uh, Elon and X was cancelled for a bit. He's now come to a deal with them whereby he's going to appoint a, a local person, but he has to pay millions, millions in fines. What's your take on Brazil? Well, Brazil, as I said, uh, I, I, as I've said, is a place, it's a, it's a first cousin country to the United States. It has about 200 million people. It has the, infused with the Portuguese work ethic. It's an extremely uh, uh, successful country. And, um, you know, they, Brazil have been doing things that we think about doing here in, in our countries, they've been doing it for donkey's years. They, they were they were making cane fuel in the fifties, in the sixties for cars. So you know from sugar cane, um, they they've had atomic energy there f since you know the sixties or something. I mean, this is a very very advanced community, and um, at the same time, because it's made up of so many different kinds of people, admittedly, government must be quite difficult, and so. Uh, and, and if you try and maintain a democracy, which can be voted out all the time, you, you, you're going to have a lot of people doing their utmost to throw stones. And so um, it stands to reason that there's a, there has to be a balance between allowing certain amount of anti-government propaganda and allowing uh, and only up to a point where, it's, where it becomes seriously uh, destructive. You shouldn't have that. And But there should be a, a point at which... They, the, the two sides come together and you, you can you can get away with it. You shouldn't be saying things that that if, that actually hurt people, right. you know, hurt them to their core. I mean, you shouldn't be doing that and, and taking advantage of people's 
you know, weaknesses or inadequacies. No, no, you shouldn't be doing that. But um, as far as Brazil is concerned, it's a secret country. It's a country, a hidden secret. And I don't know if you know this, but in southern Brazil, the climate in southern Brazil is what you would call air conditioned the year round. So uh, in Porto, uh, Porto uh, the, the city at the bottom, in, in towards the uh, border with Argentina. Anyway, the thing is, it's got the largest expatriate Japanese community, the only expatriate, genuine expatriate Japanese community in the world. Yes. It's the only country in the world where Japanese people have decided to leave Japan en masse for right. and live. Yes. And that's in Brazil. And it's a sort of secret. Brazil is a wonderful secret. And if you ever go there, and you sample their cuisine oh, and how it's, inexpensive it's it is. No, I, I've had the, luck, the the joy of going to San Paulo and, and, and Rio and, and that fantastic stuff. Well, what was really, and you make a good point about Japan because there is a, a natural affinity there. And as you say, I think it's the, the, the largest group of Japanese outside of in Japan is, is in, is, is, absolutely. But was interesting, I, I, I did a lot of work with, with Japan. I, I look, at, look after the big advertising agency there and the broadcasters. So I used to negotiate their Formula One contracts. And it was in the time we started in the days of Ayrton Senna, who was a massive hero uh, in, in Japan. Oh, and yeah, used yeah. to happen, he was, but he was brilliant because he would know, not only would he go around when he won, he made, won many, many races. He would not only take the Brazilian flag, he would then and take the Japanese flag and do a lap with that. And the Japanese just absolutely adored yeah. him. Why do you think Brazil and Japan have that sort of affinity? I, you know, Brazil is a country, if I could give up my, my roots, which is difficult, yeah, I would go and live in Brazil right. happily. You know, if the circumstances made me have to go and live there, I'd, I wouldn't have a problem. It's just having to give up your roots and your friends and all that sort of stuff. But Brazil, everything is all right. They take better care of their dogs. Than, than most people take care of their, their own families. I, I've yeah. never seen anything like it. They have dog grooming parlors. They take better care of their dogs than they do of, 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 of than the many countries take care of their, their populace, of their people. It's just too unbelievable. Um, everything works there because it's this Portuguese system of, of you know, we don't do things wrong. Right. It, for many years, I've had many aircraft. Most of my spare parts for aircraft come from Brazil. They're made under license by Continental from America and Lycoming are made in Brazil. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's just an amazing country. And it's, it's, a, it's a hidden secret. It's a secret. And I think they'd like to keep it that way. Maybe that's why they don't want Twitter, to, or rather X, to get too involved <laughs> there, because they don't want people to know about Brazil. Um, you know, this, this, everybody in Brazil is happy. Yeah. You, you probably noticed that. No, everybody smiles. There's no unhappy people there. Even the ultra poor people, I forget what they call them. I, I used to know the names of them all. Yeah, uh, up on the hills that live. They're, they're, they're they're sort of absolutely, but and, and quite worrying. It's it's quite sad seeing that because there's a, a lot of wealth, but there's also abject poverty. And as a result of that, when you get that combination, obviously it can be quite incendiary. And there's quite a bit of crime as a result. But they're not unhappy. I've never, I didn't see any unhappy people. Okay. And so I've never seen any unhappy. I've traveled right through Brazil on a bus. Yeah. Used a bus to go okay. all the way through Brazil, and and traveled thousand miles, thousand miles through Brazil, and everybody's happy. Right. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what it is. They, they have a, they're not jealous of anybody, and uh, they don't try to. Uh, they speak their own language. So if you're in Brazil, it's very hard in Brazil. In once you're out of the centres, to be uh, to only speak English, it's very difficult because they speak Portuguese. So they don't right. have a great need to learn anybody else's language. They're a bit like Americans in that respect. And um, so yeah, no, no, it's it's a, a very a big secret to Brazil. I know. How and, many languages um, do you speak as a traveller? Well, you know, I, I've I try to have a smattering of German and 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 I've tried French, you know, and 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 things like that a little bit wherever I go to try and at least be able to say good morning, thank you, and so on. Right. And um, but I speak Dutch and I speak um, uh, English. That's all really properly. But uh, German, I can speak reasonably well if I'm there for a while. Except okay. everybody speaks English, so. Yeah, so it, it does make it easy. The English seems to be the, uh, apart from Spanish, and so so widely spoken. Um, uh, Elon, how many languages can he speak? Well, he's also like me. He's spoiled. You know, we we are we are techies. We don't we're not too much into the language thing. Right. And um, I know Kimball went on a special course to speak Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. 
because he figures that so many people in America, it's the other language in America, oh, Spanish. Absolutely. You know, and um, so he he, did, he went on a course to speak Spanish. I think he's quite good at it. Yeah. Um, I don't think Elon would worry that much, you know, to, to, to take up brain matter to learn Spanish when they can speak English. Yeah. So no, he's a little selfish in that regard. No, I, but, I think um, Kimball's right, though, because uh, at my school, Lord Wandsworth College, they, they basically taught Spanish as opposed to German because they said it's more widely spoken, uh, the number of people who, who speak that sort of thing. And um, we, we talk about the, the other thing in the, in the news, and basically there is now this bromance uh, with, with Elon and, and Trump and the position he's been offered as a result if Trump wins. Um, what's your take on what, what Elon would do politically uh, if Trump were to win? Well, you know... Um... I'd start off by saying I was someone who thought government should be run by people like me and people like my colleagues. And one day, I, as, as it happened in the past, I happened to become friends with the prime minister of the country, of this country. And one day he said to me, um, when I said to him, you know, we should do this, we should do that, we should be doing this. And he said to me, he was very much better spoken than I am. And he said, when, when you run a country, Errol, you don't have um, a people. You only you have to deal with everybody. You have you have to put everybody in a in 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 a job. You have to put everybody in your in your team. You have to take the cripples, those who are not so clever, those who are, uh, you know, and this and that and the other. You put it much better than I did, but I'm trying to say what he said. And so I have to do that. I can't do what you do. I'd love to do what you do, but I can't do what you do. So now we look at Elon. He's used to. You know, having a company like SpaceX, where um, if you apply at SpaceX, I think their original motto was, if you are 10%, if you are the 10% of the best, you have a, about a 1% chance of getting an interview at, at SpaceX. Right. So if you're in the top 10% of the best, your chance of being interviewed at SpaceX is, one, is a tenth of that again. So... That's how he's been running uh, SpaceX, and and um, and and so it's been had a, a tremendous advantage. But if he gets into government, and of course Tesla as well, if he gets into government, he's going to be faced with the same problem that the prime minister of this country was explaining to me. And I would say that um, if he was given the type of job, it would be a very good thing if he was given this kind of job, and if he was placed in a position as a figurehead. And he had people underneath him, but he, he couldn't go in with an axe and, and take people out as he would in, in his uh, private businesses. He'd have to, um, you know, uh, learn to, to, to deal with the fact that these companies, these organizations do not run it at 100 percent efficiency. They probably don't even run at 50 percent efficiency. And but I would say at the same time that these many of these uh, parliament, these uh, government uh, bodies are not running well. And and I do remember being in, I, I had lunch with the South African ambassador to the UN once in, uh, in New York uh, many years ago. And um, he introduced me to some people in the government at the UN, in the American government. And they were very proud to tell me, this was in the 70s, they were very proud, or 80s, early 80s, he was very proud to tell me that the American government does never will never exceed 25%. People in government will never exceed 25% of the population. I seem to remember him telling me that, which he was very proud of. And um, he said, we don't want more than that number of people from the people in the country working in government. And I think th that's changed. And I think that the governments, the, the, these government bodies have become bloated and they do need to be trimmed down and, uh, uh, you know, improved. Now, I did say earlier on when I was talking to you that when you travel through the States, you, 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 everything works. There's no street lights hanging from poles. There's no street lights that are out. There's no roads that have potholes. There's no, the, everything, every city looks like it's just been, had a remake. It looks like somebody's just been in for a redo, uh, uh, you know, whatever you call it. Uh, every place you arrive at. And, and, so you, you, you have to give them credit for that. But I would say at the same time that if Elon went into government, he would probably start uh, asking them to trim their, their numbers. And uh, much as he has done at, uh, at X and uh, get rid of the, uh, the, the, the unnecessary people and put them back into productive work, you know, in, in the private sector. 
Yeah, and, and absolutely, sometimes it needs a businessman to go in there and say, actually, you need to do the pruning in order to make sure that the business survives. Because so often people turn around and say, well, like, that's outrageous. You've gone into this particular company and you basically got rid of all the people who've been there for a long time. And I think you were telling me last time, was, was it James who, uh, James Musk, uh, your your nephew, who actually was uh, doing the trimming at X? Yes, he, he was given the job by Elon of trimming Twitter. And he trimmed it very effectively from 8,000 to 1,000. And, um, you know, 1,000 left over. 1,000 is an enormous number of people. Nobody can remember 1,000 names to start with. So, um, you know, that's a large number anyway. But he trimmed it down. Uh, Elon took the flack for it, but uh, James did the firing. Yeah, and, and uh, we, we often say it's, right well it's, all, it's always thousand. Elon in the firing line because most yeah. one, probably the most famous person, say yeah. the de facto president of uh, the United States and things like that. Um, we're coming up to another break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about Mars and how Donald Trump is saying that he will form a new colony in Mars together with Elon's help before uh, the end of his presidential term, the next presidential term, if he's elected. Uh, don't touch right. that dial. Okay.